All right, everyone. Well, this is Mr. Uh, Trent Horn. Uh, Mr. Horn model, uh, Mr. Horn uh, converted to the Catholic faith and earned a master's degree in the fields of theology and philosophy and bioethics. He serves as staff apologist for Catholic Answers, where he specializes in teaching Catholics graciously and persuasively engage those who disagree with them. Trent models that approach each week in the radio program, Catholic Answers Live, and on his own podcast, The Council of Trent. He also has been invited to debate at UC Berkeley, UC Santa Barbara, and Stanford University. Trent is a junk professor of apologetics at Holy Apostles College, and has written for the National Catholic Bio, uh, Bioethics Quarterly, and is the author of nine books, including Answering Atheism, The Case for Catholicism, Why We're Catholic, Our Reasons for Faith, Hope, and Love. I recently got the opportunity to meet him at a Young Americans uh, Freedom Conference. So with that, Mr. Trent Horn on video. Hey everyone, thank you so much for having me. I wish I could be there in person to give this presentation for you, but it's nice to be able to address you in this virtual format. And then I'm really excited after this short presentation, we'll be able to just do uh, Q&A with one another. We're actually filming for our School of Apologetics right now here in San Diego. So we have this thing called the Catholic Answers School of Apologetics. You can visit it right now, schoolofapologetics.com, and you can go and check out classes by me, and Jimmy Aiken, and we're gonna have more classes coming soon from Tim Staples and Carla Broussard. You can learn how to do apologetics. So go to schoolofapologetics.com. And so I'm here and I actually finished filming a new course I'm doing called How to Argue Against Abortion. So hopefully that'll be available in a few months you go, you can go and check out. And so I figured why not present um, my presentation, The Beginner's Guide to Defending Your Faith, here on our lovely, and it's a lovely set, right? It's a, it's a really nice set. They've done a really good job with this. So I figured why not present to you my presentation here, and then after the presentation, we're gonna do a live Q&A session with all of your questions on apologetics. So once again, I'm really grateful I'm able to speak to you all, and I've been asked to speak on the topic, The Beginner's Guide to Defending Your Faith. So what does that entail? Well, you've probably heard me or Tim Staples or Jimmy Aiken answer not only Catholics who have questions about the faith on our radio program at Catholic Answers Live, but if you listen to Catholic Answers Live enough, you've probably heard us answer questions and arguments from non-Catholics who watch our show. In fact, the, my favorite radio shows that I do for Catholic Answers Live are the ones where Catholics are not even allowed to call in. These are shows like, why are you an atheist? Why are you pro-choice? And why are you Protestant? Well, I mean, we don't do the show like, why are you an atheist? It's more like, why are you an atheist? Why are you pro-choice? We ask in a genuine spirit of inquiry so we can have real dialogue with people. And the reason I do that is so that I can model for people like yourselves and others who are watching how to have these conversations with people about our Catholic faith. Now, of course, I always enjoy talking to my Catholic brothers and sisters, but here's what I really like about the shows where only non-Catholics can call in. And you, you get to really hear apologetics in action. And you get the opportunity to learn how to defend your faith by listening to a real, unscripted conversation. I mean, I've had people say to me, do you have plants? Do you have people that call and kind of work for you? I'm like, no, because I couldn't even make up some of the arguments and questions that we get on Catholic Answers Live. But I love doing this because this is how apologetics should be done. It's not about, this is your question, here's my answer, and just giving someone a a long speech. It's about having a real conversation with them. And that's what I want to teach you in the course of this presentation. How to be an apologist or how to be someone who uses arguments and dialogue in order to defend the Catholic faith. Now I've been in situations where I've been hammered with arguments and I wasn't really sure how I should respond. Have you ever been in that situation where you feel like you're in over your head, people are asking you questions and you don't know the answers to it? I, I was worried, I just couldn't respond because I was so worried about giving people all the answers to their objections when I should have just focused on using questions to guide the conversation where I wanted it to go, all right? So the Christian apologist, Greg Kokel, he puts it this way. He says, when we ask questions, it takes us out of the hot seat and it puts us into the driver's seat of the conversation. So what does that mean? It takes us out of the hot seat. Sometimes people ask you questions, you feel like you're, you're under these hot lamps and they're grilling you, they're interrogating you and you don't know what to say. But when you're asking the questions, you're in control of the conversation, you're at ease, you're more relaxed, and you can have a better time sharing the truth with someone, ironically, when you are the one asking the questions. 
Let me give you two historical examples to make my point of people who are great at this. Uh, first, in the fifth century before Jesus lived, in the city of Athens in ancient Greece, there was a philosopher. There was a guy named Socrates. And legend has it that when Socrates visited a friend of his named Caraphon, well, Caraphon, I'm sorry, visited a mystic, this woman who you know, dabbled in medicines and had these weird visions. Caraphon visited a mystic named the Delphic Oracle. And he asked her, is anyone wiser than Socrates? Now, the Delphic Oracle is really funny because sometimes she would give answers that could be taken in one of two ways. So a king went to her once and said, uh, should I go to, into battle against this other king? And the Oracle told him, if you go to battle, a mighty kingdom will fall. And he thought that meant he would win, but it turns out he lost. A mighty kingdom did fall. So Caraphon goes to the Delphic Oracle in ancient Greece and asks, is anyone wiser than Socrates? And she answered, no human is wiser. But Socrates is really confused because he thought, he's like, well, I don't have special knowledge. How, how could this be? So he tried to prove the oracle wrong by finding other people who were wiser than him. So he would go around asking people questions. So it's interesting is the oracle said nobody's wiser than Socrates. That could mean Socrates is really, really wise, or Socrates is actually of average intelligence and everybody else are kind of slow or dim. So Socrates thought there's got to be people who are wiser than I am. So he goes and he asks people questions. But then he realized these supposedly wise people, people that sounded wise, when Socrates would ask them very specific questions, they couldn't answer his questions. They sounded wise, but they weren't really wise. You know, what they believed, it often didn't make any sense. And that's when Socrates had his epiphany. His pupil Plato recorded him as saying this, I am wiser than this man, for neither of us appears to know anything great and good, but he fancies he knows, he fancies he knows something. But I appear to be wiser than he because I do not fancy to know what I don't know. A lot of us think we know what we know, but there's a lot of things we don't know that we don't know. Socrates is one of those people. He had a firm understanding of what he, didn't know, what he did not know. So he was humble. So he's really the wisest person because he knew the limits of his own knowledge. So Socrates engaged in many dialogues with opponents. And these were eventually recorded by his student, Plato. This approach to engaging an opponent through the artful use of questions is now called the Socratic method. And it's my favorite approach when I talk to people who disagree with me when it comes to issues related to the Catholic faith. So as Greg Kokel says, uh, by asking, I take questions, by, by asking questions, it takes me out of the hot seat and puts me into the driver's seat of the conversation, the place I always want to be. And, and this approach is really helpful when you're just starting out as an apologist and you don't know a lot of answers to questions right off the top of your head. But remember this, you don't always need the right answers. You just need the right questions to help another person come to know the truth. But before we talk more about the Socratic method, how you can use it to share our Catholic faith, I wanna share with you one other person in history who used the Socratic method in great effect in his own ministry. All right. Think of the times in Scripture when people like the Pharisees or the Sadducees questioned Jesus. How did Jesus respond to them? Did he give them a lengthy argument? Or would Jesus ask them really pointed questions that would put them into a dilemma and reveal the problem with what they believed? You see, in Mark chapter 11, we see a brilliant example of this, what Jesus does. After Jesus cleared the temple of the money changers, he made the whips, dro drove the money changers out of the temple, a group of the religious leaders tried to challenge Jesus' authority. This is how Mark records the scene. It says, And they came again to Jerusalem, and as he, Jesus, was walking in the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him. And they said to him, By what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you this authority to do them? Jesus said to them, I will ask you a question. Answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Now, here's this question. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from men? Answer me. Now, notice what Jesus is doing here. Jesus doesn't answer the religious leader's question and give in to their demand that he prove who he is. Instead, Jesus asks a question to expose the weakness of his opponent's own position. He even demands that the Jewish leaders answer him and not try to weasel their way out of the question. So Mark continues, 
And they argued with one another. If we say from heaven, he will say, why then did you not believe him? But shall we say from men? They were afraid of the people for all held that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And Jesus said to them, then neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. So what Jesus does here is he exposes the Pharisees, their lack of authority, without even having to answer any of their questions. So it's perfectly reasonable to use the Socratic approach to defend our faith, because even Jesus used it to defend his own earthly ministry. In fact, I saw the value of this approach long before my time as a Catholic apologist. During my years after college, I would travel the country as a pro-life apologist and speaker. I would stand up for unborn children in some of our country's toughest environments, the public university campus. Through hundreds, if not thousands of hours of conversations, I learned how to use questions and other dialogue techniques to help people see the truth of the pro-life view. Part of our training at Justice for All involved the use of what they called three essential skills, which were originally adapted from the Christian apologetics organization, Stand Reason. Here's how they go. Number one, ask questions. Number two, listen. And number three, find common ground. So let's go through each of these steps and you'll see how they work. In any conversation, try to use these three steps. The first step is basically what we've been already talking about, or the Socratic method. But there are particular questions you can ask that will help make your conversations more productive. If you're not sure what to say in a conversation about the faith, you can always fall back on these two questions. What do you think? And why do you think that? Too often, we just assume that we know what other people think, and we don't bother to ask them what they actually believe. Also, we sometimes just let people's beliefs go unchallenged and only defend what we believe instead of asking them to defend what they believe. That's why another good question to ask along the lines of, why do you think that is, how do you know that's true? The next time someone makes really bold claims, like the Catholic Church is pagan, or there's no evidence for God, be sure to ask him, how do you know that's true? Where's your evidence for that belief? And don't get them to say, well, you prove it, because they're the ones making the claim. They got to prove their claim. You see, when you ask someone why they think the way they do, or how they know that what they believe is true, you're asking them to give you an argument that justifies their position. Now, an argument is not a, isn't just a situation where two people are yelling at each other. That's an informal argument. Instead, a formal argument is a tool in philosophy that everyone, whether they call themselves a philosopher or not, uses. An argument is just a series of premises that are connected by reasoning to support a conclusion. Here's an argument, very famous one. All men are mortal. Socrates is a man. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. All right? So in this argument, the premises about man being mortal and Socrates being a man support the conclusion about Socrates. Think of an argument like a, like a table. You know, there's a table right here behind me. It's held up by legs. The conclusion, what you're trying to prove, is the tabletop. And the premises are the legs of the table. If one of the premises or legs of the table is faulty, tabletop comes crashing down. And when it comes to an argument, if the premises are false, or if they're not connected to the conclusion with good reasoning, the argument comes crashing down. So when you hear someone make an argument, or even when they just make an assertion, like, oh, the Bible's just made up, ask yourself, how is this conclusion being supported? Are the premises true? Does, does this reasoning work? Asking a question is especially helpful when you have conversations with the two toughest audiences, family members and people on the internet. But conversations with family and close friends can get explosive because these people know they know us well and they can push our emotional buttons. On the other hand, conversations on the internet can be explosive because these people don't know us well. And they hide behind, an, sometimes they hide behind an anonymous profile picture and it enables their rude behavior. And sometimes we, being online, we get rude because we miss those nonverbal cues of other people. In both cases, a set of questions can lower the level of hostility. With enough practice, without having to make a single statement, you can help a person see that what he believes does not make sense. Our first essential skill for conversation was taking questions, but the next skill is listening. You know, too often we ask a question and then spend our time thinking about what we want to say next instead of actually hearing and comprehending what the other person is saying in response to our question. So 
now that I've, so you want to do is show the other person you've listened to them. And a way that you can do that is to repeat back what you've heard from that person. You could say, all right, you told me, you said this, let me repeat what I heard. Did I understand you correctly? So the important thing is to listen and not listen to refute them, not listening long enough so you can fire back, listening to reflect, to truly understand what they're saying. So once you've shown you've listened, you can ask another series of questions. Uh, so instead of asking a series of questions like, what do you believe or why do you believe that, you can ask what I call our challenge questions. What they do is they look at what a person believes and you say, wait a minute, does something that person believe, it doesn't make sense, does the table fall apart? And you'd ask a challenge question to show that. Now my goal in this kind of situation is not to embarrass the person or make him feel bad, but to show him that what he believes it's incoherent or it doesn't make sense. This should make him more open to hearing what I believe and that he can see what the Catholic Church actually teaches. So to give you an example, if I'm talking about abortion with someone, I might say, all right, first I'll do these gathering questions. Well, what do you think about abortion? Do you think it should be legal through all nine months of pregnancy for any reason? Now that I'm asking the question, I'm in the driver's seat. And if the person says, well, I think it should only be legal in the first three months, and you can then ask, well, why? Why did you pick three months? Once again, you don't have to know anything. You're in the driver's seat. Why just the first three months? Well, because it doesn't look like a baby yet. So we've asked, now we can challenge. Say, wait a minute, you're saying it's okay to kill something because it doesn't look like a baby? Help me understand, there's, there's people who are born that are disfigured who don't look human. Could you kill them? So that's a challenge. It takes a long time to practice to learn, but you gotta hear what the person says to see if it falls apart. Here's another one that's very easy to see. I was talking to a guy once at, at campus, at university campus, and he said, uh, you are such a rigid person, Trent. You think it's just black and white. He said, but the truth is there is no absolute truth. And so I'm like, okay, you don't think there's any absolute truth? No, there's nothing that's true for everybody. And so could you think of a challenge question? Is this guy inconsistent? The guy says, there's nothing that's true for everybody. Well, wait a minute. He thinks that that's true for everybody. So are you saying that, that there's nothing's true for everybody, even that statement? So a challenge to show what the person believes, it doesn't work. And so as we go through this, it helps people to see that what the Catholic Church teaches makes a lot more sense. So it's from that revelation of God, we can help people to see that our faith is in accord with reason. Pope St. John Paul II even said this in his encyclical, Faith and Reason, uh, in Latin, Fides et Ratio. This is how, what he says at the beginning of the encyclical. Faith and reason are like two wings on which the human spirit rises to the contemplation of truth. And God has placed in the human heart a desire to know the truth and a word to know himself, so that by knowing and loving God, men and women may also come to the fullness of truth about themselves. So let's just recap. When we have conversations about the faith, we need to ask questions, especially what do you think and why do you think that or how do you know that's true? And we need to listen to the person, really, truly listen. Then we should ask challenge questions to show there's a problem with the person's worldview. And then finally, throughout our conversation, we should try to offer common ground to help people show that we can agree with one another. That's the third skill, offering common ground. Steve Wagner, the author of Common Ground Without Compromise, he defines common ground this way. We should build common ground to begin a dialogue about truth. We should also retreat to common ground frequently, not to give up on finding truth, but to gain the footing so we can move forward to a new consensus on what is true. If he, Steve says, if dialogue is like being on a car going on a trip to the beach of truth, then common ground is the gas. Your dialogue will have to access common ground in order to move you forward, and then you'll need to stop and refuel sometimes as well. So when we can agree with someone, say, I'm for abortion, what about women who can't take care of their children? I agree with you, poverty is really difficult, and that's very hard. I don't get a lot out of the mass. Why would you bother going to mass? It's boring. I can understand how there's parts of the mass that are hard to follow. I, and sometimes I feel that way too. It's okay to agree with someone, to find agreement. But then to the point is to move from the agreement to then move to where we can resolve that disagreement. So I could say, yeah, there's times at mass where I'm tempted to say, I don't understand, or I'm kind of bored, and I want to check out. But when I fully understand what's happening at the Mass, to know that heaven has met earth to receive Jesus in the Eucharist, that snaps me right back into understanding this is the most important place I could be at right now. But before I say that, I should find common ground and agree wherever I can. So common ground allows people to focus on their agreements instead of their disagreements. Now, 
It's enjoyable to talk about what we agree about, and we can be tempted to only talk about agreements. But that's why it's important for us to remember that common ground, it's not an end. It's a tool that helps us solve our disagreements. In fact, in a meeting with more than 200 representatives of other world religions, Pope Benedict XVI said that dialogue, it's not meant to create good relationships, uh, but that the broader purpose of dialogue is to discover the truth. All right, so we've seen that the secret to apologetics involves, once again, three essential skills. Asking questions, what do you think, why do you think that, relevant challenge questions, listening to understand, and finding common ground. That's it. If you can use those skills, you'll have better conversations about not just our faith, but anything. And then the more you learn about our faith, the better the conversations will be. But remember, this is a, it's a lifelong process, so you shouldn't get frustrated once you realize there's a lot to learn. And we're all learning. God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the people he's called, including you. But that's why we have to go out and engage in conversations with people, and we learn more and more through this practice. Let me give you an example of a very memorable conversation. I was at Balboa Park in San Diego filming a documentary, and I was asking people what they didn't like about the Catholic Church. So it's a fun afternoon, right? Some angry people. One guy was interesting. He said, I don't like the Catholic Church because they won't let gay people get married. And I said, okay, well, so how would I respond? You might want to fight. He said, I asked questions. Well, why don't you like that? He said, because two men or two women should be allowed to get married. And so I said, okay, so you're saying you, are, you don't like the Catholic Church because it doesn't let people get married. Two men, two women should be able to get married. He said, yeah, that's right. I said, well, all right, uh, I understand your position. So I was asking questions, listening. Then I asked a challenge question. Well, help me understand, what is marriage? And he said, well, marriage is just when two people love each other, they get married. I said, okay, so you don't like the Catholic Church because it says two men, two women can't get married. But can I ask you a question? What if it was a guy and three women or a girl and four men? Should they be allowed to get married, like three, four, or five people? He said, no, of course not. I said, so wait, you're mad at the church for saying these people can't get married, but you say these people, like three, four, or five people together shouldn't get married. Aren't you doing the same thing? It seems like a double standard. And he said to me, yeah, well, it's my double standard, so it's okay. I gave him my email and hopefully talked to, in the hopes I could talk to him more. But sometimes in these conversations, you're not going to move somebody overnight. It takes a long time for people's worldviews to change. But you can plant a pebble in their shoe, a thought in the mind to get them to think about it. So regardless of the facts or knowledge you've learned pri previous to this talk or even later, the thing is you can always use these three essential skills to have life-changing conversations. And you should continue to use them even after you've learned the ways to answer objections to the faith because they're very powerful. The goal here is not to just give someone the answer. It's by asking them a question, they will arrive at the answer on their own, and it's more powerful that way. So the next time you're in a conversation about the faith, don't worry if you don't have all the right answers. It happens to everybody. It's happened to me a lot. I was once hanging out with a group of friends, and someone introduced me to a guy who worked for a euthanasia advocacy group. Euthanasia is when doctors kill patients to relieve their pain. And he heard I was pro-life, and he said, why won't Oh, you're pro-life? Why can't people die with dignity? Why can't they just choose to die? And this was way back when I hadn't studied euthanasia a lot. And I was really flustered. I didn't really understand. I knew euthanasia was wrong, but I couldn't explain it to the guy. I even like got on my laptop when he wasn't looking. It was like anti-euthanasia arguments. Eventually, I just kind of squirmed and the conversation moved on. But that's, that's, not the, wrong, that's the wrong attitude to have. No one has the answer for every question. And so what we have to remember what we have to remember is that you don't need to have the answer for every question. Instead, you need to have the question for every single answer that is present. And by having those questions, what do you think? Why do you think that? Uh, help me to understand where you're coming from. You can reach out to people. And by the way, if you want to challenge someone in a helpful way, if you want to say, that doesn't make a lot of sense, but you're worried that the person will, will take it the wrong way, what you can do is you can say, okay, so you believe this about abortion. You think it should be legal, and it's just, a, it's just a fetus. What does that matter? Well, I have some Catholic friends, and they think this. Or my Catholic friends say, fetus just means little child. So, you know, what would you say to them? So when you do that, when you're able to, you know, use these hypothetical friends to bring them in, then it's not like you're fighting toe-to-toe -to -toe with that other person. In fact, what's better is we don't want to fight toe-to-toe -to -toe with people. Instead, we want to stand shoulder to shoulder and walk with them on a journey towards the truth.
so that we can do, as uh, St. Paul says in Ephesians 4.15, we can always speak the truth in love. Or as 1 Peter 3.15 says, always be ready to give a reason for the hope within. Uh, reason, uh, by the way, I'm an apologist. The Greek word apologioi means to give a defense. That's where it comes from, 1 Peter 3.15. Always be ready to give a reason for the hope within, but do so with gentleness and with reverence. And that's what we need to do and always remember when we engage others, no matter what. Ask questions, listen, find common ground, challenge the person. And if you don't know the answer, just say, you don't even have to say, I don't know. You can say, that's a really good question. I want to go get you a really good answer. And then email or call them later because you don't have to have all the right answers. And you remember, it's not a fight toe-to-toe. -to -toe. You have to win right at this moment. You walk shoulder to shoulder with that person. And you might be walking with them for weeks or months or years before they come to the fullness of truth about the Catholic faith. But the entire time we do that, we have to remember to always be ready to give that reason, but above all, to do so with gentleness and with reverence. And so I hope I've given you guys some basic skills just to start your journey. You can take these skills and you can have great conversations about our faith. Right now you can do that, and I hope that you will do that. But now we're gonna close out the video. Uh, and I'm ready in the waiting in the virtual green room to engage you all in uh, a Q&A session, open floor, objections that you've heard about the Catholic faith. Uh, how do we respond to that, to Christianity, to God, moral teaching? Uh, I think that'll be uh, really wonderful. I hope, these, I hope I've given you the basic framework. Now I'd like to fill in the gaps. We can do um, some solid Q&A. But once again, I'm so grateful you all are here. And let's go right into that Q&A. Awesome. All right, but with that, we will move into um, Q&A. So uh, Mr. Horn is here. So uh, if anyone has a question, firstly, about just the, um, the talk, then uh, please go ahead, and then we will move into more general questions uh, after that. Yeah, I think we already actually we have our first question coming from um, Ainsley. So Ainsley, if you'd like to unmute and uh, ask a question, go ahead. Awesome. So... I'm a convert and my family is not the hugest fan of Catholicism. They get pretty angry whenever I bring it up. Like, how would you go about that conversation? Well, I think what's important here is, uh, first of all, can, can everybody hear me all right? Yeah, okay, good. Yes. Um, I think following the advice that I gave in the talk is uh, you should just spend, instead of like explaining to them a lot about Catholicism, you can ask them a lot of questions like, what do you think about Catholicism? What do you think are some good things about Catholicism? What are the things you don't think are good? Why do you think that? Um, what would it take for it, for you to ever become Catholic? Like, you know, I think by asking a lot of questions first, what do you believe? And then asking them, okay, why, why do you think that the church teaches this? Or why do you think it's wrong the church teaches that? If you spend a lot of that time asking them the questions, it doesn't, they, they won't feel as defensive about it, I think. And then you can just kind of gently challenge them. Um, and then you can offer them resources. Say, hey, here's something, a resource if you want to learn more about the Catholic faith, you might find interesting. Like my book, I wrote my book, Why We're Catholic, for that reason. Why We're Catholic is a super easy book. You can give anybody. Uh, it's short. Uh, a lot of people have benefited from it. So I, I think that, you know, you might say, hey, here's something. I'd be happy to read it along with you if you wanted to, like, sharing a copy and talking about it. Uh, but I would tr try, like I said in the talk, asking a lot of questions and getting them and then figuring out why they believe what they do and then gently challenging them where you can. Awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, next, um, Matthew, go ahead. Uh, hi, Mr. Horn. Uh, so Howdy. my question is relating to kind of Mormons and obviously they, you know, they believe they're the true church and they- Sure. Kind of interesting, they have seven sacraments and, and the prophet and things like that. But mm -hmm. I was talking to a Mormon and we're going through Ignatius's Ignatius of Antioch's letters, and right. he references a part where Ignatius talks about the Sanhedrin of God, um, mm -hmm. and Jesus makes a reference to that in the in Luke. It's like this, you mm -hmm. know, this um, seven group body of seventy people who make decisions, and he was arguing that Jesus set that up and that the early church had that with Ignatius, um, but since the Catholic Church doesn't have that, and the Mormon Church does that means that they're right, obviously. 
And I was just wondering if you knew anything about that um, topic in particular. Well, he, in his letters, uh, Ignatius often makes metaphorical um, connections. So for example, he talks about he, the Sanhedrin of God is a comparison Ignatius makes to the presbyters. He refers to the presbyters or the priests as the Sanhedrin of God. The Sanhedrin, of course, was the, the teaching body of the Jewish rabbis among, among the Pharisees during the time of Jesus. And so uh, Ignatius makes a lot of these kinds of uh, metaphorical connections. So he'll say things like, follow the bishop as Jesus Christ follows the father, for example. Uh, but what's very clear and is problematic for Mormonism is that Mormons believe there was a great apostasy. They believe that shortly after the deaths of the apostles, they believe that after the deaths of the apostles, the church fell away. Uh, and the, the true church of Jesus Christ ceased to exist, and it was not restored until around the year 1830 by Joseph Smith. But the problem here is that Ignatius is very clear that the church certainly does exist, and he places the authority of the, of the church in bishops who are the successors of the apostles. And in fact, um, uh, Ignatius is very clear that you are not, in his letter to the Tralians, he says, you are not a true church unless you have, uh, unless you have the three orders of, the, of holy orders. Unless you have deacons, priests, and bishops, you're not a true church, and you cannot do anything without the permission of the bishop. Uh, so Ignatius seems very clear to know that there is the church of God that is still persisted, is still here. And uh, the Mormon arguments for the great apostasy, I would say, just don't show up. That when Jesus references the Sanhedrin, he says, yeah, do what they say, but not what they do, because they're teaching the truth. They just don't live up to their own standards. But when Ignatius talks about the Sanhedrin of God, he's making a metaphorical comparison that just as the, the Jewish Sanhedrin taught Jews during Christ's earthly ministry, the presbyters, the priests, teach people now. They are the replacement for the rabbis. Uh, but they certainly have their, their authority comes from the fact that they were ordained by the episcopate, by bishops, and the bishops only have their authority because of a direct continuous line to the apostles. And that's very clear in the early church that the authority is derived from that direct apostolic succession. Uh, so I, I think that that's probably the point I would bring up is to say, look, when Jesus said, for example, you know, he gives a command to his followers, if someone wrongs you, go to them, go to other brothers, and finally go to the church. I think that's in Matthew 17. No, not Matthew 17. I think it's Matthew 18. Uh, he says, you know, go, go, to, go to the church. And, uh, well, if that's the case, then in the year 1500, where were people supposed to go? Like Jesus would have given these commands about the church, but for 1800 years, the, the, the church didn't exist. I actually wrote a whole booklet on this called 20 Answers Mormonism that you may find helpful uh, if you would like this kind of a brief little primer on Mormonism. That'd probably be my reply to, to that particular issue. Yep, thank you. Awesome. Sure. Right. Thank you, Mr. Um, the next question is um, from Will, you're cutting Noel, out and he little. asked, how do you handle someone who refuses to point? Who what? Back? Um, yeah, one second here, I can ask it. Um, Noel is wondering, how do you, um, respond or answer to somebody who just doesn't accept your um, your points and just refuses them. Is there a certain limit to how far you will walk with somebody? Uh, you gotta use your best judgment here. Jesus said uh, in the Gospels, "Do not pass, do not cast pearls before swine, lest they turn about and trample you underfoot." Pearls before swine is the principle here, or another principle in the Gospels, Jesus told the, the disciples, if a village rejects you, shake the dust from your feet. Some people just aren't going to listen. They're not prepared to listen at that moment. So you can say, well, maybe they could be in a bad mood. Who knows? Say, all right, maybe we can talk about this at another time. You don't have to shut the door. You can just put, push pause on the conversation. So I think you should let people know that if someone's just not willing to have a conversation, they can't recognize any valid point just push pause on the conversation and give it a little breathing space. And then maybe you'll have a better opportunity to return to it later. Might be, might be my advice to that. All right, great. And then our next question is from Brianna. Um, do you want to unmute and ask Trent? Yeah, awesome. So obviously this is youth apologetics and a lot of us, or I think most of us 
are in school and uh, a lot of us go to sure. public school, I think, and I'm personally in high school. And I was just wondering, is it mo like morally wrong to go against that authority in our public schools to maybe share our faith? Because I mean, we hear a lot about our faith, but uh, not a lot of us get to share it in person. Sure. Well, what I would say is that the the Supreme Court has made it very clear. Uh, there was a famous Supreme Court Supreme Court case a long time ago, probably about fifty years ago. It was during the Vietnam War, where students wanted to wear black armbands to school to protest the Vietnam War, and the school said, "No, you can't wear that." And it went to the Supreme Court, and the court sided with the students and said, and there was a famous line in that case, I forget the name of the case, but the line was, uh, students do not ch check their constitutional rights at the schoolyard gates. And so what that means is that while public schools cannot be religious, what that means is like a teacher can't lead a class in prayer or the principal can't share the gospel over the loudspeakers. But students have the right uh, to share their personal beliefs with other students uh, at lunchtime, in the hallways, in personal conversations. Uh, if you're given an opportunity to select a topic to share in a, a uh, an assignment for a public speech, it could be a religious topic as long as it is, as long as it pertains to what the general topic is for uh, the class. Now, I mean, uh, there might be, uh, let's see, Tinker. It was the Tinker case. Yes, I want to just put it here in the chat. Tinker versus Des Moines. That was right, the Tinker case. And um, uh, and then there, there, so there are cases where it may be a bit of a gray area, but in general, if people, if someone can share atheism or pro-choice or other ideologies, Christian students have to be allowed to have the same flexibility to share things. So uh, if, if you're able to um, start a club, if there can be clubs of any kind, you can start a religious club. It just can't be mandatory for students. Uh, so uh, yeah, I would just say it's, it's fine and make it open-ended, ask questions, maybe start a Catholic club at school. I, that's how I became Catholic. I, went, I started going to a Catholic club at my high school. I wasn't even Catholic. I just liked the people who were there. So I, I think we, as students have an obligation to do that. They should, um, but their first obligation is to do their schoolwork and get good grades. But I think that when it's appropriate and prudent, sharing the gospel is very important. Now, you know, maybe like not in the middle of class and everyone's trying to study or do a test or something. But when it's natural to share things or ask questions, you 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 absolutely should. And then if people try to give you grief, uh, you can contact groups like the Alliance for Defending Freedom that uh, stand up for students' rights. Yeah. So awesome! Thank you. Sure. All right. Um, and then our next question is from Tyler. Tyler asks, um, let's see. So what if we are using a platform for apologetics where it isn't very viable to ask questions? What do we do in that event? I think he's talking about um, media such as TikTok or Instagram. Oh, sure. Or other um, platforms. Well, I think what you can do there is uh, you can ask you can ask a rhetorical question to get people thinking about something uh so you might you know just just say to somebody let's say it's pro-life is something like have you guys ever thought this is weird that if a woman if a pregnant woman gets murdered that's two counts of homicide but if she has an abortion that's not a problem that doesn't make sense to me. So the idea is you can make a short message and just say, hey, I'm pro-life and here's why, or I'm Catholic, here's why. And I think that's fine. If you can do it short and in a winsome way, that works super well. But the question thing can work in the other way. You could say, hey, why do you think Jesus said this in the Bible? He says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, truly, truly, I say to you, you know, why would Jesus say this? And then people left him and he could have corrected them, but he didn't. What do you guys think? You know, just to, the goal is to get people thinking about about some of these these tough issues. So that's another way you can use the um, the question approach if you're on a platform where you just have a short message you can share. Sometimes if it's just a message and an answer, that's fine. But if you want to just share a question for people to consider, that's another good way to go about it. Great. Um, and then 
So Tyler, does that answer your question a little bit? Yes, thank you so much. All right, awesome. Um, Isaac is wondering, um, let's see, how, uh, have you ever known someone to convert after reading a novel or other Catholic literature? Is that a good way to convert people? Yes. Yeah. It I mean, it doesn't work for everybody, but for a lot of different people, it can be helpful. I know people, I mean, I don't know them, but I know of people who have converted after reading very good Catholic novels. A famous one is called Bride's Head Revisited by Evelyn Waugh. Uh, it's a good story about a, a major theme in it is grace. Honestly, one of the best, I think one of the best stories, probably one of the best stories that talks about the theme of grace and the law is probably Victor Hugo's Les Miserables, though most people are familiar with it with the musical Les Mis. Uh, so uh, yeah, uh, there's a lot of great Catholic novels uh, one can pick from, even a wide variety of genres, whether it's uh, Tolkien or uh, Flannery O'Connor is one of people like kind of darker stories, if you will. Uh, but uh, yeah, from Catholic fiction can actually be, if it's good fiction, can do a good job in, in those areas. Great. So we have a, little, a longer question here from V. She asks, how do you explain to a pro-choice Catholic what free will is? Normally, every pro-choice Catholic she's spoken to has said that uh, they are pro-choice because they feel women have the uh, freedom to choose. We have we hear that a lot with the ACA. They're not you know, pro-abortion. They are pro-choice. So how do you explain sure. to them what free will is? What I would say is free will just means the ability to act without being determined by something outside of you. So free will means you have the ability, you could have done something differently. You could have chosen something differently and there's nothing outside of you that determined what you did. So making laws against something doesn't take away people's free will. It respects their free will. And so I would say to this person, they say, well, women should be able to have abortions because they have free will. What they mean is abortion should be legal because they have free will. What I would say is, all right, let me ask you a question. If someone has free will, should they be able to chain themselves to the door of an abortion clinic to keep people from going inside? So if the person says yes, then it's like suddenly you can, I mean, you can keep raising the stakes. Should they murder people? Should they rape people? Eventually, they do believe in certain laws. If they say no, if they say, well, no, your free will doesn't let you, you have free will, but you still can't be allowed to do that, then it's like, okay, then there's the issue. You agree we have free will, but the law respects that if I use my free will to hurt somebody, I'm held accountable for that. Whether it's, and from your perspective, whether it's blocking an abortion facility, or from my perspective, going and getting an abortion or providing abortion services. So free will is just the ability to act. We're not robots, we're not computers, we're not animals. And so we can be held morally responsible for the decisions we make, and laws can be passed to, re to regulate those decisions. Great. Does that answer your question a little bit, V? Um, tell if you're still here. Yeah, I did. All right, Thank awesome. You. Sure, sure. So Trinity asks, um, you mentioned this actually earlier, how do we respond to people that say that drinking the blood of Christ is uh, prohibited in the Levitical law um, with the drinking of blood, blood sacrifices. Right. Well, what I'd say is that that goes all the way back actually to the Noahic covenant. Um, you know, do, do not drink the blood for the blood is the life of an animal. And what that was probably referring to was the idea that you don't want, God did not want people to try to superstitiously or based on pagan ideology derive their life from animal, from animals in the sense of almost worshiping them. Eating them is one thing, but thinking that their blood has some kind of life force to transmit to them uh, would bring them very close to, to pagan ideology. Uh, so the idea, the argument here goes, well, if you can't drink animal blood because of what's in the book of Genesis, then you can't drink the blood of Christ. And I'd say, well, no, the book of Genesis is talking about drinking blood under the form of blood of a dead animal, uh, of a non-human, of a non-human, you know, a non-human animal. It's for a specific purpose under which that that law was mentioned. But the laws about what kind of animals to drink or eat—that's uh, something that is not universal because we see that in the Book of Acts, uh, and then later in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, uh, 
the prescriptions on what animals are, are, are you know, the Jesus uh, absolved the dietary laws in the Gospels. Then later, eating meat sacrificed to idols is, is relaxed in Paul's letter to the Corinthians. These are provisional matters to prepare the people of God. What I would say is that if Jesus is God, if Jesus is God and has given to himself to us under the form of bread and wine, then he has the ultimate authority to decide. He has the authority to decide how we receive his very life and his very grace. Uh, what I would say to the person is uh, to under, I think for a lot of Protestants, they have a hard time with the Eucharist because they think, why, why even bother? Why would I do this? And I think you should ask them first the question, if it's just a symbol, it's a weird symbol. Like I would get if Jesus said, drink my water, because water satiates thirst. And Jesus speaks of himself as living water. You'd have more of a leg to stand on if it's a metaphor. He says, drink my water. But drink my blood is a weirdo thing to, to, to say, unless the point is Jesus wants us to receive him as a Passover sacrifice. That's the key with the Eucharist is to connect it to the, the new Passover. Because the reason we talk about Christ's body and blood is because when blood is taken out of someone's body, that means they're dead. So we, we're not receiving, of course, the dead Christ, but we are receiving the sacrifice Christ made in dying on the cross, but presented to us under his glorified body and blood. And so then we, re we receive the Passover lamb as a result and complete the new Passover sacrifice. So a lot of that, I have a chapter on that in my book, Why We're Catholic. I'd also recommend, Brant Petrie talks about this objection a little bit too, more at length, in his book, Jesus and the Jewish Roots of the Eucharist, which may be helpful. All right, great, thank you. Um, we have a question sure. from Will. Well, hey, Mr. Horn, uh, thank you for coming. I'm a huge fan. Uh, I was glad to thank meet you. you at the YEF conference a few weeks ago. Yes. So I yes. can be back. Um, my question is basically, how do we approach not uh, not people of other denominations and religions, but uh, Catholics that disagree with us? For example, your big thing is socialist uh, Catholics. How do we approach people like that, not just like um, Protestants and uh, atheists? Well, I think when we approach other Catholics who disagree, one, you should allow it to be that there can be disagreements among Catholics on things that are an open question. So it's like sometimes there's different tribes among Catholics. So like, well, I'm a Latin mass Catholic and I'm a Eastern Catholic. I mean, I go to a Byzantine church. I'm a Novus Ordo. It's like, you know, fine. People have their different liturgical flavors. Some are more preferential to others. One ought not to make a big fuss uh, or even on theological matters. People will say on free will, I believe in what Thomas said about free will. Other people will say, I believe what uh, Molina said about free will. And the church is an open question. You can believe either. So one, you should make sure we we're talking to the Catholics when we disagree. If it's something we're allowed to disagree about, not make a big fuss about it. If it's something we can't disagree about, then you have to make arguments whether so you can have biblical, historical, philosophical arguments. But then you can also point to look, if you're Catholic, you believe in the authority of the church, how do you interpret these authoritative statements? So if they're pro choice, I would say, how in the world can you be pro choice when Pope John Paul II? basically affirms the infallible, te he doesn't make an infallible statement, but he essentially affirms abortion is an infallible teaching in um, uh, Gospel of Life. Or with socialism, how do you get around when Pope Pius XI says no one can be at the same time a true Catholic, sorry, a good Catholic and a true socialist. So I would make arguments from reason also, you can defend those things with reason, but then point to um, uh, the magisterial teachings that are very explicit on these things that we cannot disagree about as Catholics. And then to ask them also, if they say, oh, well, Catholics can't, don't have to believe this, or they can believe that, where does the church teach that? Ask them, where does the church teach what you're saying? Because most of the time it's an opinion. It's not what the church teaches. All right, thank you. Sure. Right. Um, our next question is from Eddie. He says that he's has many, uh, Protestant family members, and he finds uh, himself having theological conversations with his aunt. How would you suggest um, how to start a conversation that would be fruitful and hopefully convince her that Catholicism um, is the true the faith? I think what you have to do in these cases, no matter who it is, you got to turn the tables and get them to defend what they believe. 
So if you're Protestant, like it's it's always hard. It's kind of like with Protestantism, Protestants and Catholics, the dialogue kind of starts with, well, we're going to assume Protestantism is true. And then if it's up to you as a Catholic to prove Catholicism is true, and if you can't, I'm going to be a Protestant. That's not how it works. The, I would say, why should anyone be a Protestant? Why should anyone believe that God, that divine revelation is found completely and only and sufficiently in 66 particular books of the Bible? 66 for Protestants, 72, 73 for us, depending on how you count it, deuter the deuterocanonical books and all that. But to get them to defend that, because a lot of times, because that's the Achilles heel, that's the weak link. Why should we believe in Protestantism when you can't really give us an authority? But Catholicism does have an authority based out of uh, tradition, history, and scripture. We do have that. So I would just really go on uh, kind of the offensive with questions, not being offensive, but get them to defend their worldview, the source of their authority, and, and why we should believe sola scriptura, uh, salvation by faith alone. Uh, even sola fide, it's like, well, it's because the Bible teaches it. Okay, what do you mean by the Bible? How do you know the Bible is the Bible? You always have to really get back to um, authority. But there's other things you can do to get it closer to Catholicism. For me, in my conversion, uh, salvation really was actually the big one more than authority, because I felt that the Protestant view of salvation just did not make sense, especially of what Jesus taught about salvation. If you, if you look at what Jesus says, it's nothing like salvation by faith alone. In fact, a lot of Protestants will say, that Paul contradicts Jesus because Jesus didn't mean to teach us about salvation, which is, which is ridiculous. So. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, mm -hmm. So we have um, someone here who's trying to convert an ex Muslim online. And at the moment, the person prefers Eastern Orthodoxy and Sunni Islam. Uh, and he says that mm -hmm. the person says that Roman Catholicism can be manipulated by the Pope. Um, for example, purgatory isn't really authentic Christianity. So how do you respond to somebody that says that the Pope manipulates the church? Well, what I would say is that the Pope uh, grants doctrinal unity to the church. Uh, I would say, look, how did God organize his kingdom throughout salvation history? He always selected a single mediator over, over his, um, uh, his kingdom and a chain of single mediators. So some people say, well, yeah, we have a single mediator now. It's Jesus. Well, no, because you go back to the kingdom of Israel, there was the king of Israel, but the king always selected a, a prime minister or a vizier to oversee the kingdom when he was away. In Isaiah 22, 22, that's, that's very clear. Uh, when the, the righteous Eliakim is selected to take the place of the wicked prime minister Shebna, and uh, that same language in Isaiah 22, 22, when the prophet Isaiah says of the prime minister of Israel who served under the king, uh, what he opens, no one will shut. What he shuts, no one will open. That's very almost the same as what Jesus tells Peter in Matthew 16. I give you the keys to the kingdom. What you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What you loose on earth will be loosed, uh, loosed in heaven. Uh, so we see that same uh, leadership structure and then it, it makes sense to have like like any king like any organization on earth think about any organization even among human organizations the successful ones have a single person on top um, nearly every country has a, a single president or a single prime minister an army has a supreme allied commander or general uh, a, a business has a ceo uh, so even among human organizations without a single person at the top not being a tyrant but having a place where authority can vest to grant, to give unity to other factions is, is, is very important. Because we see this, like let's take Eastern Orthodoxy, for example. Uh, the problem there is that you start to have, a sh there's no way to guarantee uh, the continuity of doctrine over time. One element that, that is a source of this, take the issue of contraception. You read Eastern Orthodox theologians in the year 1960. They say contraception is a sin. Today, it's pretty loosey-goosey among them. Uh, now, you can find Catholic theologians that are bad, but at least the Catholic Church has a universal catechism authorized, promulgated by Pope St. John Paul II, that gives us clear doctrinal uh, uh, outlines. So the role of the Pope is not to be some kind of dictator who manipulates things, 
but he serves that special charism. It's why Jesus chose Peter. He didn't choose all the apostles equally. He chose Peter in particular to have a leadership role in the church. And the history of the church bears witness to that office continuing throughout history. A good resource I would recommend on that for the Pope is a new book out by my friend Joe Heschmeyer called Pope Peter. And I would, I would highly recommend that. So. All right, great. Well, um, it is getting to that hour mark, so we don't want to keep you for too long. My final question would sure. be that, so we are actually just a group of young Catholics, um, ages 13 to, I think, like 22 sure. or so. Um, and just started a few months ago. Now we have over 350 young adult members um, with a small like website kind of thing and just trying to um, help each other grow in the faith. And we have many actually um, young, young kids who, whose parents themselves are not mm. Catholic and they just found out about Catholicism through Instagram or TikTok and other social media. Sure. And they started conversing and joined our group. And now they've, you know, actually really want to get baptized but their parents don't want them to get baptized so it's, it's a great thing that's um started and so i think our final question would just be do you have any um last words of advice for us as we continue to grow in our faith and um yeah. hopefully you know just continue to bring um young kids um to mature sure. in the faith and because th i think that's that's the future of the church right now is is in the um is in our generation of it Definitely. So I would say first, just be respectful of your parents. Uh, doesn't mean you have to agree with them, but don't be mean to them. Uh, just be a good example of the faith to them. That's an important thing for you to do. And then finally, I would just say when it comes to living out your faith, you have to think of the foundations of it as like a, a triangle. I think of it as a triangle. And there are three sides you need to have that I would encourage you to focus on. One side is going to be intellectual foundation learning and knowing about your faith. The key documents to read are the Catechism and the New Testament. You read the Catechism and the New Testament, a few pages a, a night, you'll have it done in a year. I would say that's extremely important. And then just other supplemental books to learn, intellectual. Uh, the other one would be emotional. Emotional would be having a support network. The more you get deeper into your faith, the more the devil will attack you to try to tear you away from it. So having a good support structure of other people to hold you accountable when you don't feel like going to mass, you don't feel like going to confession, if you are running with a bad crowd, having other good friends, even if they're in a distance that you see online, that support group is incredibly helpful to have. Um, intellectual, emotional, but the most important one, the base uh, is gonna be spiritual. If you don't have that, if you don't have a constant prayer life and constantly accessing the sacraments, going to mass even more than once a week, as often as you can, confession once a month, a daily prayer. Without that, your faith is just going to shrivel up. It's going to die. Uh, so I would just keep a balance and all that. And then if you fall and if you you know, fall into sin or you feel lazy about the faith, you feel like you, you don't want to study it anymore, uh, just use it as time of renewal. Offer that to God. Go back to confession. Go on a retreat and just keep striving towards holiness. And you're going to be spiritually growing but you won't recognize you're growing until it's been a few months or years down the line. Just like you don't see yourself growing physically until you look at old pictures is the same when you're growing spiritually. So I hope that's, I hope that's helpful. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Um, I think, you know, everyone else, you guys can all unmute and um, say a quick thank you to uh, Mr. Horn for joining us today. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm a big fan. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. We all have a good good evening then. All right. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you yeah, too. You as well.